It was way back in 1861 that George Richard Dent left Sydney in search of suitable timber for his craft of boat building. Within five years of his arrival, George Dent had established two shipyards on Currambine Creek. George's two sons, George Jr. and Joseph, followed their father's trade. Two important ships built by George Dent's son, Joseph, were the Lady Scott, later to become the John Cadman cruise ship on Sydney Harbour, and the Lady Denman, both designed for the inner harbour ferry trade. The Lady Denman was launched in 1911. She was 33.5 metres long, had a 7.6 metre beam, and was designed to carry a maximum of 500 passengers in comfort. She looked fairly much as she does now, except for her colouring and minor modifications. She was a welcome sight as she plied Sydney Harbour with school children, commuters and tourists. In her long life, she made the headlines several times. The Sydney Morning Herald reported on the 20th of May 1960 that she'd collided at night with the Royal Navy submarine, HMS Anchorite. No one was hurt, but the lady's wounds took a week to be healed. In 1965, she ran aground off Nielsen Park with no real harm done. And in April 1976, she left her wharf at the quay without her master on board. The Lady Denman was being decommissioned from service in late June 1979. By July 1979, the Transport Commission declared that it would be willing to donate the Lady Denman to a responsible body if she was used for public purposes. This was to be the first time that a transport authority had donated a ferry for community purposes. A committee was formed under the chairmanship of Huskisson's John Hatton with the task of returning the Lady Denman to her final resting place at Huskisson where she was built back in 1911. The Royal Australian Navy was approached and wonder of wonders agreed to tow the Lady Denman to Huskisson for the cost of the fuel, since it would be a way of giving their sailors some much needed experience in the art of towing vessels. So, for about a thousand dollars, the Lady could be towed to her final resting place. The Lady Denman was first transferred from her decommissioning place at Balmain to the naval base at Garden Island, and then on the 3rd of January 1980, she was towed by harbour tugs out through the heads and into the open sea where HMAS Snipe was to take her in tow to Huskisson. Just off Botany Bay, the southerly breeze became a southerly buster. Fearing that their tow would sink, the Snipe's crew turned the tow around a manoeuvre not without peril in a rising sea, and made it back to Garden Island, tow and all. The lady's injuries were tragic. There was heavy damage to her bows, bulwarks and decking. Water had risen inside her to a level halfway up her forward fuel tanks. She was at sinking point. At the start of the new decade, the Denman Committee was well and truly strapped for cash. So it was a great relief when the newly established Birkenhead Point shopping complex and the Sydney Maritime Museum agreed to mount a joint media campaign to raise money for the repairs to the lady. In April 1981, 
the lady was again on the move, first to the Sutherland Wharf at Cockatoo Docks, and then on May 20, 1981, to the Howard Smith berth at Balmain. Andrew McKillop, owner of the fishing boat MV Hollandia, turned up and inspected the lady. He knew she didn't have an official certificate that would permit her to clear the harbour, but he looked her over and decided that he could make the tow safely. It was 2am on the 1st of June 1981. The lady had to be out of Sydney Harbour and on her way south. Weather reports from the Nowra Naval Air Base had indicated clear weather ahead. Hollandia tied up beside the old vessel and was connected to the tow rope. Clear of the heads, the four-man crew organised themselves into two shifts. Abe Mehmet and Ian Ellis, a motor mechanic, went below on pump duty. Neil Gage, the journalist, and Les Phillips, a local truck driver, were responsible for above-deck duties. Every two hours, the pumps were run to get rid of the water seeping through the ancient hull, and the whole boat was checked from stem to stern. The rubber ducky emergency raft was safely strapped on deck. There was no way of knowing just when the crew might need to make a quick exit to the tow vessel. Wollongong slid lazily by. The crew tucked into their main course dinners, cakes and hot drinks. They couldn't have cared less when the Coast Guard came up on their emergency channel and gave them a sodded roasting for not notifying them and for not having an official harbour clearance. Everyone was jubilant, from the crews on both vessels to the Denman Committee listening in at Huskisson. Nothing could stop them now. Or could it? The lady was slewing dangerously and Mario needed to ease the tension on her, lengthening the tow rope. By 9pm, he decided to ask the Navy for help and radioed the Naval College at Jarvis Bay. Soon HMAS Tobruk arrived and positioned itself between the wind and the lady to give her maximum protection. With a Navy helicopter hovering overhead, the tow was resumed very slowly and the lady, well protected by the Tobruk, rounded point perpendicular. It had taken a mammoth five hours to negotiate the Shoalhaven Bight. They finally entered Jarvis Bay and made it to the naval dock at HMAS Creswell. But they were not home yet. There was more heartbreak to come. The lady would have to fight her way a paltry few kilometres to her next berth. The next stage of the lady's journey was to be from HMAS Creswell's dockyard and closer to her final destination at Huskisson. Not a long journey by any means, but one needing the greatest care and expertise. <coughs> Finally, on New Year's Day 1983, three years after the first abortive tow, the lady began what was planned to be her last move. And it wasn't until the 3rd of April 1983 that the Lady Denman was firmly secured in her land berth within sight of the Dent Slipway where she'd been built 71 years before. The Lady Denman was home at last. Her homecoming, that long saga of difficulties and triumphs, remains a great tribute to the dedication, the guts and the know-how of a committed team of men and women. By January 1985, the Lady Denman started to look more like her once beautiful self. The local Aboriginal people added their efforts. Aboriginal employment programs, sponsored by Shoalhaven Council and the Aboriginal Legal Service, resulted in the building of barbecues and a brick amenities building within a beautiful garden setting. The Council donated $50,000 towards the cost of the buildings. Night and day for months on end, skilled volunteers worked on the history, the photographs and artefacts that would be displayed in a museum fit for the lady. Warren Halloran, son of a pioneer surveyor and real estate agent in the area, donated $158,000 for a second museum building. Warren donated an extensive collection of maps, plans, documents, historic paintings, surveying and navigation instruments and a host of maritime artefacts. Thanks to Mr Halloran, 
the Lady Denman Museum and Museum of Science and the Sea houses one of the finest collections of surveying and navigation instruments to be found anywhere in the world. Fittingly, they were officially opened by Dawn Fraser, triple gold medal Olympic swimming champion, and Kay Conti, the first woman to sail solo non-stop around the world. The Lady Denman now rests beside the museum buildings amongst tall, straight-spotted gum trees, ironically the preferred planking timber of the pioneer boat builders, reflected in a small fish-breeding harbour a few hundred metres from where she was built in 1911. Nearby are the native gardens, the mangrove boardwalk and the Wirikoo walking trail. Thank you.